Buenas tardes. Vamos a comenzar con la sesión que hemos titulado el cuadro exhausto o el The Tire Frame. Um, por más de 40 años el cine, no, el cine no narrativo ha servido de punto de referencia para dar cuenta de un nuevo tipo de subjetividad. Desde su origen, el cine es uno de los pocos campos de la visualidad en el cual la narrativa lineal ha generado resistencias. Los cineastas y los artistas han explorado el potencial experimental de la imagen en movimiento a través de varios formatos en museos, teatro, cine y en internet. ¿Por qué entonces el modelo teórico que ha prevalecido para el cine experimental continúa basándose en el discurso no narrativo o en el cine modernista europeo? En este sentido, ¿habrán otros caminos posibles? No solo otras nacionalidades, otras historias, sino otras modalidades de pensamiento que permitan avanzar el cuadro exhausto. Eh, eh, me siento muy honrada de presentar a Michelle Faguet, eh, que es una crítica basada en Berlín. Su biografía incompleta está en el uh, programa de mano. Eh, eh, ella va a presentar una ponencia cuyo título es ¿Qué es la pornomiseria? Bueno, le dejo la palabra a Michelle y luego pasaremos a, a, a escuchar la ponencia de Díaz y Ritwick, miradas periféricas de dispositivos como plataformas de diálogo. Gracias. Thank you. Um, I would like to thank Gabriela, Aime, and the people from PAC for inviting me to Mexico. I lived here 10 years ago. I haven't been back since then and I'm extremely happy to be back, especially in this context. Sometime during the first half of this decade, while I was living in Colombia, there was a lengthy debate about the work of a young Colombian artist named Jaime Avila, who had taken a series of erotic, fetishistic photographs of homeless men. These are the images behind me. They were shot in the style of fashion photography with something like an American apparel aesthetic, and were meant to document the quirky personal styles of each of the artist's models, presumably to give them a sense of dignity. Each portrait was then exhibited as a diptych alongside images of urban decay, lit up by tiny colored lights like the panoramic posters of cityscapes you might find in a tourist shop. Those who accused the work of being morally ambiguous or unethical used the term pornomisteria, which can be translated into English as poverty porn. And in fact, early this year, or early last year, the term poverty porn was used by a journalist from the London Times to critique Danny Boyle's representation of street children in Mumbai in Slumdog Millionaire. But the term can also be traced back to online discussions revolving around the HBO television series The Wire. However, this term managed to find its way into Anglo-American discussions about representations of poverty and underdevelopment, the original Spanish version originated in Colombia in the early 1970s and coincides with the beginnings of a national film industry. It wasn't until almost three decades later that the term would emerge in discussions about the visual arts. My presentation today will describe the historical origins of Puerto Miseria, although ultimately I'm interested in recuperating this term in relation to contemporary discussions about Latin American art that I think still seem to uncomfortably oscillate between, on the one hand, an absolute denial of a social and political context in favor of something like a homogenous, globalized aesthetic, and on the other, an uncritical and even cynical desire for representations of social conflict and economic underdevelopment. The critique that underlines this historical investigation is about the failures of, 19, of 90s multiculturalism and identity politics, which I'm personally very familiar with because I was in graduate school and beginning my career in New York City at that time. But my critique is also about the excesses of an art market constantly search in, new of, of, in search of new products and exotic geographic sites of production. And this I witnessed over and over again as a curator working in cities like Mexico and Bogota and seeing to what extent art scenes outside of North America and Western Europe are still subject to the colonizing impulses that seem to be endemic to a desire for diversity originating in the center. In the summer of 1971, Luis Ospino was in Bogotá, Colombia, on vacation from film school at UCLA. There he met with his friend Carlos Mayolo, and together they decided to film the six Pan American games that were about to take place in their hometown of Cali, Colombia. With a 16-millimeter camera, Mayolo had borrowed without permission from the advertising agency where he worked, 
The two set off for Cali but arrived just in time to miss the opening ceremonies and to, to find that they would be excluded from all the official venues without the right permits. La siguiente. What began as a spontaneous exercise in simply going out to shoot footage of a very loaded political and historical event, the film entitled Oiga Vea, which means listen, look, became a portrait of the thousands of others who had also been excluded. <laughs> the majority of Kali's population for whom admission fees were far beyond reach and who experienced the events and festivities alongside the filmmakers from behind chain-linked fences or walls. While the first part of the film depicts what Ospina and Maiolo managed to film of the games, mostly images of the crowds on the street outside of these exclusive venues, in the second part of the film, the location has moved from the center of Cali to a shanty town called El Guaval. Here, local residents talk about the hypocritical nature of an event that projected false images of economic progress and development to the rest of the world, in denial of the country's real conditions, which form the visual backdrop of this dialogue. Years later, Mayolo described his process of making documentary films as one that was fundamentally collective, and that his experience of recording footage with Ospina in marginal neighborhoods was subject and accountable to the reactions of their most immediate and relevant public the curious spectators who always gathered around to watch and comment on the filmmaker's attempt to represent their situation. Maiolo compared this spontaneous participation to having 150 assistant directors, whose presence influenced the film's structure and content much more than its anticipated reception by the cinema club or film festival publics would eventually pay to see it. Oiga Vea quickly earned its place in Colombian film history as an icon of militant cinema, which depicted poverty and exploitation in order to analyze the origins of social inequality and transform the structures that perpetuated it. However, a desire to produce critical consciousness through the transparency or visibility of marginality always brings with it the risk of producing the opposite effect, that of cynical indifference that comes from a saturation and fetishization of this visibility in the absence of proper analysis or even a very basic code of ethics. In Colombia, the most significant cultural historical aspect of Mayolo and Ospina's legacy is the term they invented, porno miseria, to articulate a problem that became endemic to Colombian filmmaking in the 1970s, but that continues to haunt any discussion about the representation of a socioeconomic other. The history of Colombian film is characterized by a series of frustrated beginnings, and it's not until around 1960 that there's anything that, that even remotely resembles the national film industry. Most accounts agree that Jose Maria Arzuaga's feature-length narrative film, Pasado el Meridiano, and unfortunately I don't have images from this film, from 1967, represented the first significant step toward consolidating a properly national film movement. Arzuaga was a, a Spanish filmmaker influenced by Italian neorealism who spent most of his adult life toiling away in advertising companies to fund the production of his work. The protagonist of his film is an assistant at an advertising agency who confronts a series of obstacles in his journey to his hometown to bury his mother. The character is both autobiographical and representative of an emblematic, marginal, anti-hero victim to a ridiculously hostile environment. This honest representation of what was seen to be a very typical Colombian protagonist of working class origins was celebrated by a film club public, but created problems with the censorship board that would ultimately prohibit its circulation in commercial cinemas. Among the film's most enthusiastic supporters was Carlos Alvarez, a film critic who eventually began making documentary films in an attempt to implement and disseminate Fernando Solanas and Octavio Guitino's theory of a third cinema in Colombia. In their 1971 manifesto, Cinema, Cultural, and Decolonization, Solanas and Gatino proposed the model of a third cinema as part of a larger project of cultural decolonization and as an alternative to what they called first cinema, which was Hollywood, and second cinema, auteur cinema. This was also the decade of new Latin American cinema with progressive politicized film movements in Brazil and Cuba, and also Argentina and Peru. Each scene had its own national traits, but all contributed in one way or another to a critique of US cultural hegemony and to 1960s revolutionary politics, which in a Latin American context had found its ultimate expression in the Cuban Revolution. In the last years of that decade, Alvarez attended several of the most important film festivals for militant film, 
including Viña del Mar in 1967 and Merida in 1968. In Merida, Colombia enjoyed its first significant showing, most notably Marta Rodriguez and Jorge Silva's screening of a work in progress titled Chircales, 1966 to 1972. This is the image behind me. A rigorous anthropological investigation of a family of brick makers on the outskirts of Bogota that would continue for many years after to serve as one of the best examples of how to make film in Colombia. According to Carlos Mayolo and critic Raviro Arbeles, Chicales is, within Colombian cinema, the most forceful condemnation of the conditions of underdevelopment and socioeconomic and ideological mechanisms of exploitation and dependence. Like many other filmmakers of their generation, Rodriguez and Silva considered film to be an effective medium for pursuing grassroots political activism in a country in which a, a colonial economic structure was still very much firmly in place. Before studying ethnology and film in Paris, where she worked with Jean Rouge, among others, Rodriguez had come into contact with families of brickmakers while doing social work with her good friend and mentor, Camilo Torres, a Catholic priest and founder of the sociology department at the Universidad Nacional in Bogotá, who eventually gave up his academic career to join the rebel ELN, the National Liberation Army, and who was killed shortly thereafter in combat. Along with her husband and long-term collaborator, Jorge Silva, Rodriguez began conducting interviews with the families on the outskirts of Bogota and was confronted by a level of conflict and exploitation that she later claimed virtually negated all the theories she'd brought back from Europe. Many hours of audio recordings were made before the couple began to film so that the resulting footage shows a remarkable level of intimacy and trust achieved through a year of cohabitation and five years of methodical research. In the absence of screening venues for anything other than the insipid mainstream commercial movies imported primarily from the United States and Mexico, a significant part of a filmmaker's job in Colombia was to guarantee adequate distribution for one's work, particularly when this work formed part of a larger political project. During the late 60s and early 70s, film clubs began appearing all over the country. And although these clubs catered to a public eager to see independent film, Rodriguez and Silva were sometimes disillusioned with the elitism they encountered, as discussions often focused more on aesthetics than on politics. Also, without effective state intervention toward the consolidation of a national film industry, like the ICAIC in Cuba, for example, it was virtually impossible for independent filmmakers to recuperate the money they'd invested in their films, much less imagine making a living from them. Following the Cuban Revolution and the success of film, like, films like Glaber Rocha's Black God, White Devil in 1964, film festivals, primarily in Europe, began to demonstrate an interest in Latin American cinema and became both a viable option for showing work to a critical and receptive international audience, as well as an economic means to continue working independently. Rodriguez and Silva participated in festivals in Leipzig in 1972, Oberhausen in 1973 and Mexico in 1976, and eventually sold the rights to distribute Chicales to public television networks in Sweden, the Netherlands, Norway, Finland, and Germany. Although by the early 1970s, Colombia represented one of the largest markets for film in Latin America, just after Mexico and Brazil, it was the only country in Latin America that had not yet implemented protectionist legislation to enable the development of a national film industry. Under growing pressure from various professional sectors, in 1972, the Colombian state passed a resolution that permitted an increase in the price of movie tickets with a surcharge, or in Spanish, sobreprecio, that would finance the local production of short 35 millimeter color films that would be screened in every major commercial theater prior to the, the feature film. The results were astounding. By 1974, the number of short films had reached 79, which was almost double the total number produced in Colombia during the previous seven decades, uh, 1906 to 1970. However, what soon became evident was that this dramatic increase in numbers reflected opportunism more than sincere enthusiasm, because for the first time in Colombian history, it became possible not only to recuperate the money invested in the film, but to actually profit from it. From this point on, and there is a new genre of filmmaking, referred to throughout the primary sources as el cine de sobreprecio, surcharge film, 
which includes approximately 600 short films produced between 1970 and 1980, that instead of helping to create a viable industry, earned that straggling industry a pathetic reputation among Colombian moviegoers. It's difficult to generalize about the character of these films because there are so many of them and because directors range from dilettantes motivated by easy money to people like Mayolo and Ospina or Suaga who are grateful for the opportunity to be able to work in 35 millimeter color film. To many critics and filmmakers, this legislation was essentially flawed because it included the establishment of a committee for quality control that rated each film according to its alleged quality but which often function as a covert system of censorship in order to weed out films of political content. Among the most famous case of censorship was that of Mayolo and Ospina's Asuncion from 1975. This film was about a domestic employee who was constantly nagged by her very annoying employer until one day, la siguiente, uh, while the family she works for is on vacation, she gets fed up and invites her friends over for a wild salsa party and eventually abandons the house. In an interview some years later, Ospina said that it was their intention to create paranoia because, quote, domestic employees represent a class enemy under the very same roof. However, Alberto Arguida, one of the most vehement critics of surcharge cinema, has identified two major tendencies within this massive group of films. The first group produced a series of picturesque films that pandered to excruciatingly trite forms of nationalism. Quote, with the motto, Colombia is magnificent, it is tourist cinema that is insipid and manipulative. But, a more disturbing, but more disturbing were those works that represented the exact opposite impulse, Let's see the which Mayolo and Rodriguez termed pseudo-denunciation. The worst examples were documentaries that consisted of previously recorded footage of subjects ranging from poor families to street children, prostitutes, drug addicts, or the mentally ill, hastily put together with an authoritative voiceover that described the social mechanisms responsible for these social problems in very superficial terms. Without in-depth analysis or any real relationship to what was being filmed, quote, surcharge film was guilty of the worst kind of exploitation. Many years later, Mayola described this era in the following manner, quote, Latin America had become the best place for poverty. Obviously, the cinema of this era was unable to hide it, nor could it refuse to recognize it. Poverty became the theme. Everyone began grabbing a camera to film the defects, the deformations, the diseases and scars of an unequal and impoverished Latin America. They descended on the poor with their cameras, believing that with a simple act of filming, they were making a document about reality. In a similar tone, Aguida wrote, for lack of political rigor, miserabilism is common in surcharge film that attempts to be critical. Poverty is morbidly displayed and discussed at length in order to provoke commiseration in a gesture similar to that which moves the bourgeoisie to pursue charitable acts. In the 1960s, the pioneers of Cinema Novo, Glaber Rocha among them, had called for a faithful cinematic representation of the country's social of the country's social problems as a form of resistance to both the lies of Hollywood and those of a military dictatorship eager to promote a positive image of Brazil abroad. But by the 1970s, things had changed. By then, miserabilism, the representation of the poverty and violence of underdevelopment, had become an industry in its own right and acquired a negative connotation among its critics because of the spectacular and consumable characters of the images that passively reflected the estrangement that existed among social classes in Colombia and throughout Latin America. One such film attacked by some film critics, which pra while praised by others, was Ciro Duran's Gamin, which was translated Wave, from 1978, a feature-length documentary about street children in Bogota that was very well received in Europe. It won awards at festivals in Leipzig, Bilbao, and Huelva. The film documented a group of homeless children from a very young age happily frolicking the streets to an adolescent marked by petty crime that promised more hardened criminal behavior to come. The explanation offered was typical and went something like this. These children had left home to escape domestic violence 
And this abuse was the result of the desperation felt by their parents, typically farmers who had been displaced by the armed conflict to a hostile new urban environment. Luis Espina happened to attend the Cannes Film Festival the year Gamin was presented in what was the first Colombian representation ever at Cannes and wrote, quote, aside from drugs and coffee, our country is known abroad for its capitals, Gamines. Articles and documentaries on this phenomena abound on European television and in newspapers. Here in France, the Communist Party has even come out with a comic strip about Gamines, Les Petites Enfants de la Misère. In the German magazine, Die Stern, there was an article about Gamines called Die Kleine Baditen von Bogota, Bogota's Young Bandits. That year, Ospina maintained an intense correspondence with Mayolo from Paris, where he was editing the final version of Agarrando Pueblo, translated The Vampires of Poverty from 1978, a fictional documentary he and Mayolo had filmed the previous year. Ospina and Mayolo hoped this film would have enough of an impact to put an end to all those gratuitous images of poverty that had come to dominate med mediocre films not only in Colombia but throughout the third world. <clears throat> in an unpublished text titled Que es la porno miseria? What is poverty porn? written in preparation for the film's premiere in Paris in 1978, Mayolo and Ospina described the sad evolution that had taken place from politically committed independent film to, quote, a certain type of documentary that superficially appropriated the achievements and methodologies of independent film to the point of deformation. In this way, poverty became a shocking theme and a product easily, easily sold, especially abroad, where it is the counterpart to the opulence of consumption. That was written by Luis Ospina. Uh, la siguiente. Filmed in Cali, in Bogotá, Agarrando Pueblo follows an unscrupulous film director named Alfredo Garcia, played by Mayolo himself. And this is him, not the one holding the camera, the other one. <clears throat> um, where was I? As he and his cameraman move around both cities looking for unwilling subjects for a documentary commissioned by German television. The 16 millimeter film alternates between color film frames of footage shot by the directors and black and white images depicting the process of filming and everything that takes place off camera. Beggars, abandoned infants, street performers, and any mildly underprivileged looking individual are fair game as the crew fulfills its quotas of poverty. And in fact, during much of the film, the nature of the relationship between the real filmmakers and the subjects exploited by the fictional ones remain unclear so that an already tenuous line between documentary and fiction begins to blur. In Bogotá, the film crew descends upon La Rebeca, a well-known fountain in the city center that after years of neglect had become a popular swimming spot for gamines. As the character of Garcia coaches the children with the promises of a few coins, an angry man delivers what seems to be a scripted speech about the exploitation he's witnessing. In reality, however, this man was actually just a casual spectator who was angered by what he saw and made violent threats off camera against Mayolo's character. Ospina describes the scene as a happening. The, film the filmmakers placed two agitators among the group of onlookers who had gathered around the film crew with the hope of solicitating exactly this kind of reaction. In the next scene, Garcia is now in a hotel room and has just gotten out of the shower. Half naked, he negotiates a scene that will be filmed later on that day with Ramiro Arbeles, who plays himself, and whose role will be to interview a destitute couple in order to provide a theoretical explanation that mimics the voiceovers used in so many surcharge films. The actors who play the couple soon appear with the film's producer, a preppy but sleazy entrepreneur, to try on their torn, dirty costumes. The crew then sets off, but only after Garcia takes a minute to do a few lines of cocaine in the bathroom. This detail is based on real life, as Mayola was well known for his drug use. Let's see. Now in Cali, the film crew finds its way back to El Guaval, the very same neighborhood that appeared six years earlier in Oiga Vea, the work that initiated Mayolo and Ospina's participation in this chapter of Colombian film history. And it's appropriate that they've returned to this very same spot to provide a dignified sense of closure to a decade in which all of those ideals specific to a, a particular historical moment now pass, but also perhaps a product of youth 
had become corrupted and distorted beyond recognition. The crew begins to film in front of a decrepit wooden house selected without any consideration for the per person who might actually live there. When an angry figure appears, jumps in front of the camera and yells, ah, con que agarrando pueblo, no? So that's the, that's the guy. He then proceeds to argue with the film's producer and refuses a bribe offered to him by pulling down his pants and wiping himself with the bills. He then disappears into his house, storms out with a machete, an object that's heavily associated in Colombia with class conflict and bourgeois fear, and chases the crew and actors from his property. Finally, he spots a film canister on the ground, abandoned in the commotion, and laughs perversely as he opens it up, pulls the film out, exposing and destroying its contents, while doing a mad dance and draping himself in dozens of feet of film. The film ends with a man abruptly freezes in a perfectly photogenic pose, looks to the side, and asks someone off camera, was that okay? Amidst all the commotion that predictably erupted after the, return, the release of this film, one critic thoughtfully wrote, Ospina and Mayolo have succeeded in a straightforward and forceful critique, so well executed that in the darkness of the theater, one feels guilty to have participated as a spectator of all those works they indict. But others complain that Agarrando Pueblo threatened to stigmatize any further attempts at cinematic social critique. Mayolo responded by arguing that while images of poverty had been justifiable within militant cinema, the commodification of poverty had made these images redundant to a public whose conception of them was characterized by a sadomasochistic pleasure or even indifference. Also problematic had been a tendency within certain instances of militant cinema itself to import models of critique from other Latin American countries, especially Argentina and Cuba, without adapting them to the specificities of a local context. Just as the best examples of militant cinema had attempted to critique economic exploitation from the position of those exploited, Agarrando Pueblo intended to measure the reactions of the personalities behind those cliched representations of Porno Miseria in a work that questioned the very distinction between docu documentary and fiction. <clears throat> if this film succeeded in denouncing the accumulation of obscene images of poverty and under underdevelopment that had proliferated in cinema for almost a decade, it also broke with the assumption that social critique would necessarily find its most appropriate form in the genre of documentary filmmaking by implying that even the most well-intentioned attempts to faithfully represent a social problem are always already mediated. If Agarrando Pueblo succeeded in contributing to the imminent collapse of the surcharge industry, it also provided a positive impulse to the development of fictional cinema in Colombia. In subsequent works by Ospina and Mayolo, produced individually rather than collaboratively, social injustice was represented via fictional characters such as sanguine landowners or their incestuous offspring, and the image of the vampire became a constant. An idea that resembled Osvaldo de Andrade's notion of anthropovashi, cannibalism, but in an inverted and negative form. Most surcharge films were eventually banished to the archives of the National Cinematheque where the film stock slowly deteriorated as historical amnesia about this decade of Colombian film gradually set in. What did survive this history, however, was the idea of Bordo Miseria as a useful critical category. Because as long as the structures that produce and in turn consume the obscenity of poverty remain in place, there will be ample opportunities for exploitation. Thank you.
Mauricio, he's Walter. Yes. And, um, I think we'd better start saying that uh, we are coming uh, not from criticism nor um, nor from uh, history. Uh, so we are trying to speak from a less. Uh, we're not going to make any analysis, but we are going to uh, make some observations from um, from our side as film producers, as, as uh, image producers, and this is going to be done through our work um, because this is how we, uh, I think, we can best um, speak about the things that we want to um, address here, which are issues around um, how to produce images that may have uh, the that may reach the other to speak about the other. We don't uh, want to speak about misery. We want to speak about otherness, about alterity, about how we relate to each other and how these relationships again build up society. And we are trying to um, to do this through or to do this approach through our work and uh, point out some uh, observations about how we use the camera to achieve that. Um, our comprehension of ourselves as artists is as members of the general public as well, very much part of the many functions and mechanisms of the public arena. We see our main responsibility as contemporary artists being to question people's perception, including our own, about the mechanisms which affect and give form to public space. Rather than willing to directly change things, we just meet people and situations always uh, trying through these encounters to question and review the perception of each context or situation that we encounter. These encounters take the form of sensational workshops or of staged encounters that allow us to meet different people and contexts and slowly develop together a dialogue which focuses on certain issues that relate this particular group of people to society in general. We try to design concepts which will allow this very focus of debate to be expanded through the use of moving image into the public, general public. Our work is very much process and therefore performance oriented, but it's also, it, also, it also achieves a level of representation which most often consists of video installation. However, these are not meant to be a final product or a result of each project, but a further step in which the dialogical form of art which we seek to develop is taken from the very first audience with whom we already share the execution of each project to a broader sphere of resonance, the general public. The video installations that we produce are often shown in exhibitions to further communicate the subject matter of each project to anonymous individuals in the public arena. Almost all of us are interested in that what is not ours, that what we are not, or in that what we do not have or do not even know. Not always we know what we want, and yet we want it. Probably we are all so interested in the other because it's also through the other that we can better mirror and reflect ourselves. And the other is always very close, just there where we end. Our art practice has now been divided since 16 years and it unfolds this exact area between each one and the other, between the unknown territories of desire and fear, a world to navigate. Maybe that's why we are equally interested in documentary and fiction. Every image in its origin does not belong to the territory of the documentary or fiction. What will make it belong into one or the other territory will be the literature, which will be support it in order to be real or fictional. Any image can contain a literally information and serve for the construction of a message. An image is independent to any truth, lies, reality and representation to be intentionally able to exist. 
there is therefore no such necessity or possibility to really prove distinction between the two territories of fiction and documentary in the basis of creation of an image. All images are therefore somewhat interterritorial. And it is precisely in this interterritoriality, in this indefinite but existent area between two different territories, where it will become possible to create an erotic poetic field um, in which action and representation, as well as interaction and intervention, get mixed, thus producing a, rele a release of certain artistic categories established in modernism and enabling thereby new experiences and new forms of artistic practices. In working with video and film, the construction of moving image sequences can establish multiple different perceptions of time and space. Be it real or imaginary, it hardly matters. The same situation, the same scene, whether of documentary or fictional order, if filmed by several cameras simultaneously displayed from different points of view, may well produce a sequence of images of multiple character, reinsert so complexity in the narrative, and thus build a new on discourse of the real. Um, the image that we are looking here are um, of a video installation called Beautiful is also that which is unseen, which we presented in um, 2002. Uh, to, and th this title was a try to contradict um, um, a definition of beauty of uh, San Tomás de Aquino that said that beautiful is everything which makes, which provokes pleasure in being seen. And um, for that we took, um, actually, we did a collaborative work with uh, blind people and um, we thematized what would be with them, we thematized what, with what would be a vision and blindness, uh, also uh, a lot about the mirror uh, and what what, what was the role of the mirror for blind people among them. And this work obviously mixed um, documentary parts and uh, there was a script which was actually two texts um, about blindness, uh, one by a blind writer, classical writer Homer, and, then, and the other one by an equally blind writer, um, of Borges. And um, the, the uh, installation showed f um, four images of the same situation, videotaped at the same time to try to reinsert this synchronicity, synchronicity and uh, multiplicity that we are trying to talk about into the narrative. And there was also a, a fifth projection in which um, the viewers were, when they would access this installation, they would pass along a very enlightened um, corridor where they would be filmed without um, being seen. And when they would enter the installation, they would see themselves, because it was kind of, this, this was a security camera. There was a security camera in this corridor with a retarder that would project their image coming into the installation some three minutes later. So in a way that they could see each other among this uh, blind, just in what they have just done then. The prevalence of the peripheral eye over the only one focus frees the image of the dogmatic idea of revealing the classical narrative or truth of documentary material and it extends it into another kind of artistic experience. Any image can be documental or fictional. Even the eventual inclusion of archive material, either in pictures or in texts, as in scenarios, may in this case subvert the former material into new representations in film and video. The use of more than one camera eye attests principles of multiplicity and synchronicism present in real life that traditional narrative fails to translate. We intend to focus on a conceptual use of the record movie, recorded moving image where reality, even documental material, becomes fiction and where truth becomes questionable in name of an investigation between expanded documentary and relational fiction. 
Um, now the we just uh, shortly show in a documentation. Um, um, this normally a lady who um, holds the flag in the carnival. It's a work about carnival, and it's already difficult to film carnival because it's very documented. And we wanted to go a little bit out of that, and we built up a device which was like a stick with a wheel, and we placed the four cameras in that, and we turned them on, and the wheel would turn, and we would turn, and the carnival was also turning around us, so that the entire thing becomes quite um, unstable. And the installation form, uh, we repeat this um, four-channel thing, but with huge back screen projections, and um, the sound was put in the edges of the room, and would also go around the uh, viewer, like um, a carnival passing around him, which uh, he or she could not really identify. And these pictures, as soon as our camera, which we were not looking through, would stop, they would recognize what was going on, because this was just documentary material. But as soon as we danced, that turned into something totally different in, a t in terms of uh, almost uh, um, a non-dance of light and unknown forms. And uh, exactly this, uh, border of uh, an unrecognizable or recognizable reality or what is possible to perceive what reality and what's not, it's what's interesting us at the moment. In the same way that, you, that, in the same way that using more than one camera can diversify the points of view on a context, the use of more than one intention, of more than a single perception, of more than one creative voice may also diversify the action and representation in the practical experience of art. Here we try to build up possibilities of a dialogue equally interested in the interaction as in the representation of reality. The images that we are seeing now behind us were um, recorded yesterday. Um, we were driving um, in Mexico, and just before us there was uh, one of uh, one more step of this ongoing intervention that we have been doing, called the moving truck. It's a moving truck in which we put a, a projector, and uh, there is a, a back screen projection in the back of the truck, and it goes from one side to the other, or it can be parked somewhere, and we videotape that. And then, in the next intervention, we screen that video of that first truck, and then we videotape that, and the next we will again project the last truck. And so what we have at the end is a truck inside a truck, inside a truck, and always with layers of people between these screens. And this, um, um, it's a, well, an essay to, um, an attempt to materialize the destiny of the moving image, which is its own death in the next frame. So we try to put that in this space that uh, an image erases the other. And that it's, um, we should um, speak relatively about uh, the importance of images anyway. Every person possesses a complex and hybrid identity. Also complex are the means that determine and produce the singularity by which we identify each other and diverse one from one person to the next. Each one of us organizes and names that which he, she sees, hears, or touches through a unique system of meanings. Perception is an exercise of confrontation between different systems of meanings. These tensions generate the need for the creation of a poetic field in which each one's specific worldview may become questionable. With the creation of this poetic field, an individual, an individual may turn his or her unique worldview into potentiality. The dignity of every person is based, among other things, on the fact that only he or she sees the world as he or she does. That's why it's interesting to listen to the other. Here we speak of when fragments replace any hope for synthesis. 
and the artist's eyes deliberately prefer not to see through the camera eye, or yet when the thing to be filmed is only recordable by diverse cameras at the same time. We evoke the conceptual use of the camera not solely as a mean to record things, but as a device to construct an element of alterity, a dialogue, a dialogue between the artist and the world to be seen, and the viewer. To perceive the other, not just as the periphery of our own eyes, is to turn visible the layers of subjectivity that constitute the political space in which we live. Maybe this is the greatest contribution of technology into our lives today. Virtual reality philosophically confirms the force and the value of the subjective relationships that build up politics and economy in society. Our projects try to open spaces where the natural polemic that follows poetry and art turn the singularity of each individual visible thus making also visible the dignity of each person who shares that space where we live. Our work investigates how private psychologies affect and constitute public space and vice versa. We understand art as a subversion of culture in order to create a field of action where the meanings and the state of things are constantly revised. The attempt to separate subjectivity from politicization is an old hypocrisy of the intelligentsia, which is smoothly beginning to be unmasked through continuous experimental praxis in interdisciplinary fields worldwide today. To create resistance is not to eliminate conflict, but to recognize and respect difference in its most subtle and repressed forms of existence. There is not just one globe, there are real fragments. There is not just one history to be told, but endless parallel narratives to be resistantly further whispered. Um, to the PAC, uh, the CITAC, and all the present people, thanks very much. Thank you very much. then this is just next, okay. It's fabulous to be here, and I'm so pleased that um, Gabriela Rangel invited me to join this panel. And when I read Michelle's um, paper, I was fascinated by the ideas of um, porno miseria. And it, of course, got me to thinking about um, documentary film, I'm more, very, I'm more involved with media. Um, um, so the film works that she talked about from the 60s and the wonderful critique that she did raise is um, all about film, film that medium that is expensive to shoot with. There's a time lag between your shooting and you're getting the footage back from the lab. Um, as she expressed already, the, the, there's censorship issues, um, particularly in cultures like Latin America and China and other places where maybe there were dictatorships and various issues that made it very complex. Um, but still, the human spirit is very strong and for people to have worked um, hard is... Um, of course, important. So I started my work at MoMA around the time after the portable camera first came out. This is just to remind you that cameras, video, wasn't in your mobile phone. It was like this. Um, hippies, um, it, cameras weighed 40 pounds, 20 pounds. The take-up reel was reel-to-reel. It was very awkward. 
And um, but artists were very excited to have this material and be able to work with now um, to shoot. You could see it. You could go out on the street. You could um, in New York. John Alpert started to do documentaries because he got a camera and he shot a taxi riot going on. Um, so things start in funny ways and have amazing conclusions. Um, so as we know today, everything is digital and nearly everybody has a camera and everybody can capture their porno miseria and they can put it up on YouTube. Um, but I think it's interesting what our speakers already have said is that um, Walter and Maurizio now, that there's this liberation. Um, we have images and we can share and almost like we're really, I think, going to have a collective consciousness and um, do, do amazing things. Um, I like to show this image. Ideas come, muses, the muse floats through the air, and as a curator, we grab a file folder, whether that's in the computer or physical, and you, you learn by seeing things more than once. So there's so many ideas here that um, there's a lot to digest. Um, so I'm just going to go beyond that. That's something that I have up at MoMA right now. Um, but I want to go back to early video. Um, Annabella Geiger is an artist from Rio. She just had a show in Rio. She got one of the first portable cameras down in Rio de Janeiro. And what she did during the dictatorship was pretty radical at that time, very subversive. She got in a junk shop um, an Argentinian bolero. It was to the Black Virgin. And of course, the Black Virgin is the patron saint of Brazil. So what she did was she did this phonetic piece playing on words called Mapas Elementares Three. So she drew an amulet, which in, of course, Spanish, amuleta. Um, she drew a mulata, a, a black woman. And of course, these images um, are the outline of Brazil, but it's also the outline of Latin America. Um, amuleta, a crutch, and we all need crutches in our lives if we're physically intact even, and um, of course Latin America. It was quite radical for the time. Um, um, we've talked about um, the brilliant talk about the porno miseria, made me think about in my own work how people have gone, taken a camera out. And someone like Juan Downey, the amazing artist who sadly died more than 10 years ago, um, went and lived with the Yanomami Indians for more than a year. So he did this piece called The Laughing Alligator in 1979. So he, of course, with his portable camera, put the camera in the hands of the Yanomami. He became a kind of trusted um, person within the community. So there was a lot of give and take back and forth. So when Juan came back and showed that video in New York, um, you could see that there was um, this amazing interaction. And in the tape, even, there's um, a moment when the Yanomami takes um, ammunition, a bow and arrow, and is about to shoot one, because he really understood what shooting meant. Um, another artist who's quite fascinating, who got a hold of camera, that Sok Kanuk, who's an Inuit up in the north of Canada, in the North Territories. When satellite and cable came to Canada, the Inuit were very proactive and took the station when the government said, we're going to come in with a station. They said, it's ours. So um, Zok, maybe you've seen his films that he made after starting out doing very beautiful videos, which were really about language and preserving the oral tradition and the traditions up in the north. The long distance runner won an Academy Award a couple of years ago. Um, so this is um, his Kachik um, gathering place. Victor Masayesva was someone I met in the 80s. He had graduated 
on a scholarship for foreigners at Princeton. He's a Hopi. He graduated, he went right back to his reservation and started to work with video. Um, I always felt that the imagery was really of a different eye. It was not a Caucasian eye, it was something else. Um, he has come down to Central America and worked with um, indigenous people, training them how to work with cameras so they can tell their own story. Um, I've gone out into the wilderness myself, um, into China 17 years ago for the first time, and that's when I started the file folder. And um, 12, 13 years ago, I went, had a travel grant, and um, put all my inf information up online. I called them my curatorial dispatches. And it was pre-blogs, so um, as a curator, I've also tried to expand my own practice, as my wonderful colleagues here have as well. Um, so I just want to use one other example of an artist's work. Um, Lisa Raihana, she's a Maori and lives in New Zealand and um, was invited by the Pitt River Museum in Oxford, England to do an installation. So the Pitt River Museum is a museum almost like a ca um, cabinet of curiosities with um, materials that various refined Englishmen brought back from their travels over the last um, many hundred years. So what she discovered in the Pitt William Museum was a Maori sculpture, a nameless sculpture. This sculpture in her culture would have had a whole house and his ancestors would have gone to commune with him. It, they would have revered him. So what she did was she took this statue and um, she had her elders tell stories so that this um, individual would hear stories from homeland. And she also um, videoed a waterfall and projected it behind him so that he would feel comfortable, he would kind of reconnect with his land. And knowing that um, adults go to museums with children, she created a little landscape down below so children could um, engage as well. So, I think um, maybe I'll just um, close with that. This is the work of Yukon um, Teruya, a piece that will open in New York fairly soon. He's from Okinawa. You know that that's the southernmost island cluster of Japan. Um, it's where the American military base was. It's where a lot of bloody fighting happened um, between the Japanese and the Okinawa people. So Yukon has been living in New York for a couple of years and what he's doing, um, opening in a week and a half in Chelsea. He's of course an outsider, he's Japanese, so he's you know not really an outsider, but he lives in the area of New York called Bushwick. And in Bushwick there are um, very lower middle class people, um, Latinos, blacks, um, artists. So he's taken um, cardboard boxes and um, he's got little, um, um, little videos and projectors inside. So the whole thing of who we are, how we are, how we got there, um, he's created little um, toy boats that float through the gutter and it's kind of how he arrived in New York, how he arrived on the mainland of Japan initially to go to art school. So, um, let's see, what have I forgotten? So I think um, I've just tried to raise a couple of issues around video that connect with already what my colleagues have addressed. Um, that um, I really appreciated the um, way you talked about fact and fiction also. Um, narrative, everything, our lives is a, is a narrative and fact and fiction get all mushed up in our heads and then we replay it back. Um, so it's really about the dignity of the other and I think really understanding the complexity of culture and our lives. And as you said, in closing, sort of, there's not one history to be told. 
And I think that's what makes us um, and culture so special is the differences. And even though we all have the internet and digital devices and put material up online, um, our specificities give it the richness and give us our voice. So, and I'm losing mine. <laughs> okay. So there's time for then discussion and questions. So. Yeah, we should open up. Or do you have a question? Should we? Maybe we should put up the lights so we can see. Tienen alguna pregunta para este panel, para los miembros del panel? Hi, I've got a question for, for the panel. Uh, I just saw, uh, I just read a poem by Jimmy Durham, the Cherokee artist. He just recently showed in Mexico City. And uh, the, the poem is about Geronimo, the Native American Indian, uh, the, the Native American warrior, I, I should say, rather. And uh, uh, he, uh, it starts when, uh, Jimmy Durham uh, says that he uh, that he feels that in every photograph of Geronimo, he senses that Geronimo wanted to kill the photographer, and at the end of the of the of the poem, Jimmy urges Geronimo to to go to go to get away with that to to realize this situation. Uh, this comes because. Uh, of what I saw in your in, in some of your presentations, uh, I'm wondering, do you feel that in order for the other, be it any other that you might find, uh, for him or her to grab the camera, do you feel that's a way for that person to, in in some way, re make? I mean, do you really believe that the other can in some in some way or manner speak? Or, or, or have uh, these images taken in a way that is not somehow being uh, transformed into, into something else? Well, I can say one thing. I first of all truly believe we're in, at the beginning of a real revolution. Um, I think this revolution is as big as Gutenberg and the printing press. Um, technology, it's just going faster and faster, and you could also say maybe that some corporate, you know, you know, sh you know, terror. But um, I think we are empowered, and we're much more empowered than we were ever before. And um, the internet isn't closed down. I hope it doesn't get closed down. But you know, there's so much potential. And I think something's going to truly come out of left field the way Don Quixote came out of left field um, and the novel was born, <laughs> you know. So maybe I'm a naive optimist, but... Um, I, I have something to say. So maybe you're the opposite. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah maybe. <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the film, Magarando Pueblo, there was actually a collaboration between the filmmakers and uh, the guy who jumps out um, at the end, Londoño, um, he helped write the script, and um, and then there's actually a section at the end, the the fake documentary cuts, and then there's an interview with him, and so then it really blurs the line further between you know, is it a documentary? Is it a is it a fake documentary? And so they always speak about this film as a collaboration, and so you know the the other was actually part of 
part of the process of production, and so that was very empowering for him. But he died. <laughs> But he died right when the film came out. He did receive some of the money from the prizes, but he died. He he died a, a very premature death, um, basically because he lived in a house that flooded all the time, and he died from some ridiculous illness that could have been cured. So that's yeah, that's like the negative reaction to that. What what I could say is that there is this conflict is not resolvable. And it has to be part of the work as far as possible. And, and uh, however, if you point the camera at someone or someone points the camera back, and then you manipulate the images, I mean, this, these are very clear steps in producing a project or producing a, a film or a video installation, whatever. But this, all these steps, as they are present or visible, I think that's the only way to lead with that and, and really to maintain the conflict and not to eliminate, not to become a one-focused hypnotizing hypo, uh, information channel that takes, tries to take in your whole attention, but to, to, to be present as a complex uh, exercise of, of thinking. <clears throat> the, the narratives will not substitute the other in a moving image. It's uh, still a representation, and this conflict's there. And uh, it's not meant that the, an image will speak for the other. It can speak about the other. It can uh, open up a dialogue where the other can come to words, maybe directly in front of that camera, maybe later on, when uh, there is a confrontation about seeing its own representation. But it's uh, this is uh, not resolvable. It's uh, it's not re the narratives won't replace reality. It's, uh, it's different. Hi, um, Michelle. I wanted to thank you for a really remarkable talk and one that uh, I felt opened up a whole range of questions for me. But in particular, I wanted to ask. Um, if you could just take a minute or two to speak a little bit about how the filmmakers you're dealing with interacted with a larger, um, a, a larger left in Colombia in the, in the years you're talking about. And I felt like that was maybe, um, I mean, was there a, a, a more determinate audience at points or what different types of audiences uh, were maybe being addressed in different ways there? Um, it would be nice to, if you could... Well, the sort of ironic thing about the, the, this whole thing is that they, they, the film, the film did premiere in Colombia and won a prize, but then they did send it to Europe as well. <laughs> so they did exactly what you know, they were critiquing in a way, but with a mock documentary. Um, and there is kind of an interesting anecdote. Um, Carlos Mayola was a member of the Communist Party in in um, Colombia, and Luis Espina was also on the left, but he was a bit more moderate. And um, there were many different versions of this film, Agarando Pueblo, um, and there was there was a lot of conflict between Mayolo and Ospina because Mayolo wanted to politicize it far more, whereas Ospina wanted to, you know, sort of keep it as it was. And there was the, actually the first um, version that premiered in Colombia that won a, a prize that did have some extra footage and some I, I forget, you know, some some text that Mayolo had added that that Ospina later cut out. Um, but in terms of, I mean, other than Maiolo being a member of the Communist Party, the the art world and the film world is very, a Colombia is generally very apolitical, despite everything that goes on there. Um, so I wouldn't really, I wouldn't really situate this within a larger political discourse. I mean, the thing that I mentioned about Camilo Torres, he's a very imp important figure in Colombia because he was one of the first guerrillas. Um, but he was quick. He was quickly killed. So, but there is a whole mythology around Camilo Torres, and he very much influenced Marta Rodriguez and Jorge Silva. And those are probably the filmmakers who were most identified with the left, who consider their work to be activist. But since then, um, it tends to be very apolitical.
yo, yo quería pedirle a Michelle si puede desarrollar un poco te, te, te hablan en español desarrollar un poco la implicación de la noción de porno aquí el, el otro día tenemos una conversación con curiosamente con Mauricio y con con eh, Walter en que salió a la conversación la idea de el arte no debe ser masturbación de la burguesía y argumentaba que había que defender la masturbación diciendo que el arte a lo mejor es la copulación heterosexual de la burguesía y al verte junto a ellos me quedé pensando que la reacción del crítico que mencionas que dice qué mal me siento de haber disfrutado esto, el hecho que el argumento se despolitice para volverse un territorio de mera culpa me parece crucial hay ese momento en tu texto que a mí me resultó enormemente importante y trayendo la pregunta al presente voy en esa dirección primero ¿cómo podemos aceptar una terminología que parte de la noción de la denuncia del carácter pornográfico de algo hoy. Es decir, ¿cómo, cómo situarnos ante eso? Uh -huh. A la horrible maldad espantosa uh -huh. de que esto era pornográfico. ¿Cómo podemos situar esta categoría nosotros? La segunda pregunta que yo un poco querría plantear es un poco yo estaba esperando que tú hicieras el movimiento que ahora planteaste ¿cómo traemos esto al presente? yo tengo muy claro para mí que yo detesto la acusación precisamente de la pornomiseria por este problema por el hecho de que la respuesta es meramente de sensación de culpa de que se produzca este, esta imaginería y no encuentro cuál es la razón por la cual debemos sentirnos culpables pero lo estoy diciendo de una manera este, en defensa de la pornografía entonces establecido ese punto me gustaría escuchar tu posición porque creo que al dejarla implícita no nos permites hacer that's la discusión a, that's gracias esa es una pregunta muy complicada como siempre de Guadalupe bueno voy a responder con otra anécdota cuando fui invitado por el Dutch Art Institute para presentar esta investigación y los estudiantes eran muy jóvenes And, and I said something about, you know, how we, how we had to admit that we all enjoyed looking at these images, these beautiful images of poverty. They're beautiful, they're aestheticized, and I don't think that you can deny that while you're denouncing, you know, what produces these images, denouncing the system of exploitation, you are enjoying looking at these images. There is some sort of attraction. And, uh, and I said that I proposed this to my students and they all denied it. No, 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 we don't, we don't feel the same way. No, we, we derive no, and I said, no, there is a pleasure that you, have to, that you have to recognize. And I think that most people don't want to and maybe that's the reaction that comes from that. And then the pornography, you want me to talk about pornography? <laughs> I, I, I have a very, I, I don't know, I, I, I don't really know what my position is in relation to, to pornography. I have a lot of mixed feelings about it. Are we going to keep on framing the critique of that kind of pornography on the basis of a moral position? What I'm saying is that the reaction of the critic was moral. I felt bad. Right. It was not, this is not efficient for any political cause. They were trying to make a distinction between militancy and the production of this as for, as for a, a question of profit. Now, I think that that question is somehow uh, forgotten because we're just keeping on talking about the, the, the guilt principle of watching it. So my, I was basically asking you to make, uh, uh, to, to define the position in terms of the contemporary implications of this uh, category in relation to contemporary art in Latin America and exploitation. You know what I think, I mean, I don't know if this really answers your question, but it's something that is related to this, this part of my text and that I maybe didn't emphasize. But I think the biggest problem is that, in relation to contemporary art, is that, um, is when the artist, and this is, this is part of what Agar and the Pueblo is criticizing, um, for, for, exa for example, in, in the context of 70s film in Colombia, 
these filmmakers are basically standing in for the other. They, they, they have the moral authority to represent the other because outside of Colombia in, in Europe, they are seen as the other because uh, North Americans and Europeans don't, don't understand the idea of class. They don't understand how, how class functions in Latin America. So you can get away with making this type of work as a Latin American artist, as a Latin American filmmaker, because outside of your context, you are identified with the other, and so you have the ability to speak for the other. And there's, there's, a, ba there's a lack of recognition of class structures that exist within that context. And that, to me, is, the most, is one of the most important implications within contemporary art. I don't know if that really answers your question. But that's what I find interesting. It's like how much you can get away with because you are sort of masquerading as the other when in fact you're part, you're very much part, as an upper middle class filmmaker, artist, you're very much part of the structure that is contributing to the exploitation of the other, of the socioeconomic other. And of course the art world's implicated in that too. Yeah. Sí o no? Yeah. <coughs> Y la palabra, ¿puedo usar? Gracias. Este, y a, a Michelle le, un, un comentario, y es que me sorprendió muchísimo una de sus imágenes, que era justamente el niño tabiquero que sube el bloque de ladrillos en, en, a lomo, porque digo a veces hay, hay, hay imágenes que son un poco obscenas por su repetición. Es decir, hay una exactamente igual, pero hecha en grabado por otro comunista, no sé si, digo, en este caso por un comunista eh, estadounidense ubicado en denuncia del trabajo infantil, así en crudo, sin mayores, es decir, no sé si provocaba cargos de culpa o no en la gente, pero en el lenguaje, digamos, de, 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 del realismo social mexicano, esto era moneda corriente, ¿no? Y creo que es interesante porque encontrar en la historia del arte, en otro medio, es decir, primero es un dibujo y después es un grabado, y que tuvo muy buena fortuna crítica, eh, creo que es interesante cómo, cómo se van duplicando las visiones de algo que difícilmente en ese momento se hubiera llamado por no miseria, ¿no? N nada más como un hecho de coincidencia de imágenes, ¿no? No, and, and this, one, this image is, is interesting too because this is an image that you still see. I mean, I, where my parents live, they live three hours outside of Bogotá and on the, and, and on the road from Bogotá to this, this town where they live, they're brick makers. And this image, you know, it's like this beautiful aestheticized image. It's an image that you see constantly in Colombia. So, and these films, even you know, if they were made today, they would still have the same revolutionary potential because these, these images still exist. Oh, here. Just one more comment. I just realized that we're we're discussing about the the artist or the producer of meaning or the commentator of meaning pointing the camera to another. But it is funny in a way, uh, in a very ironic way rather, that uh, in Mexico we are now living example beyond example, uh, example after example of the other taking the camera, and I'm. Uh, uh, I'm uh, saying this uh, thinking of the photographs of the recently deceased drug dealer who was exposed completely without uh, clothing and, and uh, buried under the pile of money or, or the photographs of the, of the deaths that the, uh, that the drug dealers uh, themselves take. Uh, so uh, for me it is interesting that this uh, experiment of aggression against the other, thinking that the other is always going to be defenseless, is in a way uh, completely turned upside down by some kinds of other that we rather not even see in the eye, ever. That's just a comment. Sí. Bueno, lamentablemente no tenemos más tiempo para este panel. Muchísimas gracias y vamos a pasar al próximo panel.